Um, yeah, so yeah. now I can say show show captions. Mm -hmm. Oh, so there's a new show. Interesting. Huh. So closed mm -hmm. captioning is turned on. So now it seems like on the newest version, I have a hide captions, show captions thing, which has actual icons next to who's saying things, which is new to me. Mm -hmm. So they've upgraded the transcript and captioning function. That's very cool. Mm -hmm. Under pressure from you know, Fathom and Otter and everybody else. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The, new, the, the newest trick I saw was a thing uh, yesterday called Feather AI. It's in beta, and it will allegedly, if you drop an audio file on it, it will produce a 300-word summary. Uh, um, and I've tried, I've tried it on two of our Living Between World meetings, and one of them, it actually did a pretty credible job, actually useful. And the other was just, you know, garbage. That is quite cool. Um, uh, uh, on, a, on a different list that I'm on, a friend, Kyle Shannon, has been really playing with all these tools. And he created a Google form where you where he calls it the thought leadership, the automagic thought leadership generator. <laughs> and you and you put into it, you follow a couple of his cues about what issue do you care about, why does it matter, and so forth. And it comes back with a 600 word blog post, a YouTube video script, uh, humorous tweets, and something else on a topic. Uh -huh. And it's really good. Would you like, send me the link? It's post, really good. Um, I I don't know if he's if he's like broadening it out to broad communities. So yeah. I. Okay. I will I will hold the link until I've asked him whether it's if okay to share share more broadly. If and when. Okay. But there's like incredible explorations happening with these tools. Yeah. Um, and if you're in the if you're in the writing business, it's weird. It's very weird. I mean, the the best of the stuff that I've seen is actually fascinating and kind of high school level. But that'll um, change. That'll change. So my problem is some of it looks like it's college level, but doesn't know a fact from a hallucination. <clears throat> and that that seems to be one of the problems out there is that these systems kind of hallucinate. I, so I started my career, the career that worked. I was a consultant for a while and then was asked to leave uh, and then found my way into tech. And I became the neural networks analyst at New Science Associates, a 15-person startup in South Norwalk, Connecticut. <clears throat> that was that was my my entree into tech, and and I discovered that I loved being a bridge between the geeks and the business people, mm -hmm. and so I did that for a dozen years, first with New Science, then with Esther. Um, but I was the neural networks analyst, and one of the ways I was I would explain neural networks was that a neural network is better at figuring out what a maple leaf might look like because it can understand mapleness better than any expert system or other kind of thing you could describe, <clears throat> but it's not going to be, but you don't want to put a neural network on your bookkeeping. Like, like it's not adapted for that. It doesn't know precision. It doesn't know, you know, exactitude. It knows essence in some sense. And so what we're getting right now is people looking at these tools um, like chat GPT as if they're oracles that should know everything and have facts down. I don't, that, that marriage hasn't happened yet. I don't think like, you could fact check a GPT post and then probably change it dramatically. And and yes, yesterday on yet another list, <clears throat> I saw a guy who loves Spanish poetry say that he was interacting with Chat GPT, which which recited for him a Pablo Neruda poem that Neruda had never written, as if, <laughs> as, as, as if it was a real poem, and yeah. was and was confident about the poem, and when challenged on it. And when challenged on it, replied, oh, no, no, he, you know, there's this poem. And he was like, this is really dangerous, people. Uh, Gil, go ahead. Yeah, I, I have kind of the op opposite interpretation, Jerry, not, not about the Neruda poem, but about the maple leaf. I think these things will learn to get much more fact-based and precise, and I would turn over my bookkeeping to them in a future generation. But yes, and I agree with that entirely. There was a great piece, I think it was in the Times yesterday, um, uh, that uh, essence said, you know, I'm, I'm, and this is a, this is a professor, talking, you know, talking about students, gaming, and so forth. And said, um, the tell is that I'm getting things that are grammatically accurate, but have no voice. And for me, that summed up the my current mood about these things. Um, long ago, it became evident to me because I was like an analyst in the AI world that. 
<clears throat> different kinds of AI tools were really good at different parts of problems and that any little problem you looked at was actually a compound problem <clears throat> that had lots of different things that needed to act together to, to make sense of the thing. And so it feels like it feels like what's happened now is that some of the piece parts for a general AI of some sort have just shown up on, you know, in, in the arena because I added to my brain the thought we are in a post GPT world two weeks ago. So, so I knew about chat, I knew about GPT, but when chat GPT like exploded into our communities, um, I, I added that thought because it was like, oh, okay, this is different in kind. And so now I think what's happening, and I'm reasonably certain with no basis in facts that behind the curtain of Google, they have all the technology that OpenAI could have with chat GPT, except they have a real time search engine. And when you marry those things together and you can fact check the, the, the conversational AI, that actually works. I'm getting ambient noise, but I don't know from where. So how, how many of us are using ChatGPT or thinking about it? I am not, uh, I haven't played with it myself. I'm watching a lot of other people. Anybody else? Raise your hand if you've been playing with ChatGPT in any way. Oops. This is the, we don't have Pete. Pete is on family vacation, so he would have raised his hand, I think. Um, Kevin raised his hand. Oh, sorry. Um, why am I not seeing Kevin? Oh. He's not He's not on visual, but he does have his hand up. He has his hand up in the square. I didn't even see that. I was looking for, for people. Um, and Kevin used Kyle's uh, generator and uh, generated some ideas about donut economics, about neighborhood economics using donuts. Uh, Kevin, you want to talk about it? Yeah, I've used it three times this morning um, for neighborhood economics, donut economics, and then an event in Portland about repurposing church properties uh, into things like hydroponics on the grounds and stuff because uh, 50,000 churches at least are going to close over the next five years. Yeah. And our comm team is seeing it as at least good enough for first draft marketing uh, blog posts and things like that. Uh, and um, then I've been emailing back and forth with Kyle and you know, part of it is it, it, it sort of it comes through kind of like a uh, uh, you know a, a high school essay level at first. And he said, yeah, what you need to do is go and uh, go to Chat GPT itself rather than us and put in what we produce you know, in his unit. And um, so this is too much like a high school essay add more nuance, add more, you know, whatever. And so our, uh, our content editor uh, is going to, who's an English prof at a college, is going to go and play with it there because her students are starting to use it as well, not turning stuff into her. And, uh, you know, she's written books, you know, sorts of things. And I, I think it's, it's really useful and, um, I'm interested in evolving the content it produces to make it better, but it's a good first draft to start something. And um, so I'm, I'm really encouraged by it. And then, you know, somebody who really wants to go further can, can use it to go further. And it's probably only going to get lighter, faster, cheaper, better from here. I don't see that this. That's a safe bet. This craters. Uh, the, 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 the doubts I've heard are that um, maybe we're past civilizational searchability because now the search space is going to be dirtied by all these hallucinations the, and the, the search tools aren't going to be able to tell what was a hallucination from what was an actual thing. And that could really screw things up. But the capacity of these systems seems awesome. And in order to sort of pivot us into check-in mode, Kevin, I, I'm going to treat what you just said as the beginning of your check-in. Would you like to check in some more? And then we'll go to the queue. Uh, I'll, I'll create a little queue here. Yeah, well, you know, it's kind of interesting. I'm in Mexico this month with my family, uh, beach town that we were at last year, and we're just here for a full month this time. Um, kids and grandkids and sister-in-law and wife. And uh, so I've had a couple of weeks to just sit and think, and it turns out what I do when I have that time to think is start thinking about complex uh, structured databases on the projects I'm working on, just when my mind is at rest and then start to work into sort of system maps like we did that built SOCAP or that we did that uh, I did working for the global fund on AIDS and malaria around the solution set of AIDS and finding the spaces where groups should collaborate where they thought they were competitive. 
locally we're looking at i've got a group that's looking at the possibility of doing the solution set around old growth forest with the list of partners one of the more creative forestry groups is doing it we're in a big national forest uh, area and so it's kind of odd that the pattern thing i do when my mind is at rest is the same thing it's done for the last 20 years is build um, optimal system collaboration map system now you go right back to it i was just typing into the chat i don't know that you can see the chat because you're on your iphone but i just mentioned ziggy no. i just mentioned ziggy in the chat yeah yeah yeah, it, it was a software to do to enable that and make it do easier because it created both people and entities at, at the at the same field. So one could be an edge and one could be at the center, which is still I think fairly unique. Um, but then we, we we built the maps in verticals to to build some businesses around it. So uh, that's what I'm doing around the donut economics thing. At least. I love that. Um, thanks, Kevin. Anything else to check in with? No, I mean, uh, it's, it's just odd to watch the same pattern form when my mind rests. It's like there's a crystalline form of thinking that is, oh, I did that, I did that, I did that. Oh, it looks like that, you know? And it's like, it arises on its own. Kind of it's like there's thing. a human nature thing involved or something, who knows? Something <clears throat> like that, you know? Yeah. Seems like, that's having where, fun, so. seems like that's where your essence lives. So that's cool. I guess so, something like that. Um, thank you. Um, Doug, Stacy, Ken. Okay. Uh, again, again, taking a somewhat contrary position. Thinking about chat, I find chat very disruptive. Uh, I notice sometimes when somebody's saying something interesting, other people are typing in chat at the same time, which means that they're not really listening. And listening is uh, letting the words come in and uh, sink down into it, touch, touches your soul. And things like chat just prevent that from happening. End of thought. Um, thanks, Doug. And so there are three things in the chat right now, which I posted. The first one was something I mentioned when I talked at the beginning. So that was a link to anybody who wants to go look at it. The second was managing the queue for what's happening. And the third was an elaboration on precisely what Kevin was talking, what well, hadn't mentioned, but had done earlier in his career. So I thought, and, and, and I consider that our chat often, but not always, is elaborating and improving what's being said. I do agree entirely that often chat can be very disruptive. And if I were doing BOM dialogue, if I were in a different process mode, or if I were in a Quaker meeting, I would banish chat and I would like definitely like not want that to even be present. But for, but for me, like we make choices <coughs> of modalities. And sometimes if we use chat well, I find chat tremendously improves the, the conversation. Uh, Doug, then Gil, because I'm, I'm assuming you'd like to just open that up a little bit more. Yes, Doug. No, I, I think I'll just stop there. It's just that I don't think you can listen deeply and to chat at the same time. Thank you. Um, Gil? Yeah, I, 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 I have a similar sense to Doug, um, but find the chat is entirely ignorable. So some conversations, I don't look at the chat at all, and I'm just present in the room with you all. And sometimes I'm scanning the chat, and sometimes I'm adding to the chat, and it kind of depends on where I'm at at any given moment. So I, li I like it as long as it's optional and not in my face. I'm wondering what uh, chat GPT would um, do at a, in terms of analyzing a Quaker meeting. I think that would be really interesting, mm -hmm. especially the quiet part. Yeah, exactly. You could ask it, Ken. <laughs> I don't do that stuff. Really. I'm I'm still a human learning rather than machine learning kind of guy. Stacy. Well, I agree with everything that Doug and Gil said, but and I would also say if we took some time to take a break and just focus on going back and looking at what was in the chat and seeing if anybody wanted to address something that was missed, that could solve the problem. Um, I think the that chat, chat isn't very reflective and it's kind of antithesis of Quaker meeting. 
<laughs> well, I don't know about a Quaker meeting, but I know sometimes I'll put something in a chat because I don't want to forget. And I know that by the time it gets to me, we're not going to be talking about that anymore. And if I put it in the chat, it's because I think it's important enough and I really don't want to lose it. And one of the things I try to do as moderator is watch is monitor the chat for exactly things like what Stacy just mentioned, and then say, "Hey, Stacy, a little while ago said X. Do you want to talk about it? Because I because I see it the same way you just said it, Stacy." But it's um, in in fairness, it's hard for one person to be able to do that while they're looking, you know, while they're listening to the rest of the conversation. So if it was built into the process, then you have all eyes looking. Plus, it hits people differently. So that would, you know, alleviate the possibility that a gate, a gatekeeper might not let something pass through when it needs to be passed through, not just here, I'm talking about in other, you know, groups as well. Mm -hmm. Stuart, did you want to jump uh, in on this? Yeah, so I just wanted to jump in and kind of echo Doug's thought for a minute. Uh, all the studies that are coming out on multitasking say uh, it's a, it's, it, it, it's just a fantasy that you cannot do two things at once. So if you're making a comment in chat, you're probably not listening real well to what's now being said, and you're commenting on something that went on in the past. Um, and sometimes there are real interesting things that come out in chat in terms of, you know, providing a link or what have you. So, so um, I would love anybody who has run deep on that, because I find that there's a bunch of areas like mirror neurons. There's a bunch of areas of human research that I'm very skeptical of. Um, and multi this multitasking is impossible for humans thing is one of those. Um, and, uh, and I find this to be, the way I treat it is it's a polarity to manage. Sometimes you want to be completely focused on one thing and you need focus and you want to ignore all distractions. And we don't do that often enough. And then sometimes you want to be like Bruce Lee in the field being attacked by various ninja warriors and just quickly managing a whole bunch of different things with multi-sensor fusion and like immersion in a bunch of different things. And humans are actually really like, if you, the reason jazz works is that a bunch of artists are listening to each other and responding to each other with great sophistication in, in high art and in real time. And, and they're blending a whole bunch of influences and things in their heads and so forth. That That's like, like we think of that as great art. Right. And so I'm saying that the, that the individuals are capable of jazz like activities in their normal actions. Um, and so I think of this as a polarity to manage so much so that back 15 years ago, I posited Linkedo fast and slow, where Linkedo slow was focus apps where you hide every other app and all distractions and you make it so that your desktop is only about one thing. And then fast was, hey, what interface would it take so that as the incoming stream of stimuli hits me, I can bend one to just like it, take another one and repost it with a comment, take another one and forward it to three, mail three mailing lists I'm on because I know they'd be interested, take another one and do whatever else, where, where you, all, of, all of your conversations weren't these separate siloed isolated things, but where you could treat them as a whole. Um, never did, didn't write that software or anything like that, but but anyway, I'm a skeptic about the humans can't multitask things, Stuart. And 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 I don't know, I'm not a neurobiologist or anything like that. And I think that there's lots of nuance in the issue. But but when I hear people start with that, the, another thing that, that does that to me is um, a teacher from a thousand years ago dropped into a classroom today wouldn't see any difference. And it's like, bullshit. A hundred years ago, we industrialized education and it's nothing like what it was like a thousand years ago. <clears throat> right, but but that's like this this sort of spoken wisdom that I also disagree disagree with. So I'm I you just you just shifted my thinking, Jerry. So thank you. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Stuart. And I was just feeling like I was being a little kind of uh, no, uh, no you... man, manic about this t topic in a way that I think Doug would, wishes we didn't do in a check in call. So you sh um, you, sh you shifted my thinking because you made me remember times when I. You were was carrying on multiple conversations sitting at a bar, okay? And and actually there was coherence in all the convers in all the conversations, or dancing with a few people at the same time on a dance floor. So yeah, and the ninja example really is a is a is is a wonderful example of that. And there's some degree of of natural human capacity for this. Uh, I I used to host the Yi Ten calls for like nine years back before podcasts were cool. 
Um, and be because of Pip's, uh, Pip Coburn's suggestion, I was taking notes during the calls and I would summarize the calls at the end. I was also watching an IRC chat and I was moderating. I was my own tech support for the calls when things blew up and all that. And I had I was comfortable doing all that stuff. And I know that I wasn't listening as profoundly as I could have been had I been in Quaker meeting or in some other setting. So, Doug, I, 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 I totally agree that my listening ability was different from my listening quality was different from what it would have been otherwise. But that seemed to really work for nourishing the conversation and doing stuff. And then at some point, I coached someone else to do calls. And like when we did the, the, the one call with her moderating in a different uh, setting, we, she ended the call a little early. And then we did a debrief afterward. And she said, Jerry, 45 minutes in, I looked down at my note sheet and I had not written a word. And that's when I realized, oh, maybe taking notes and doing all these sorts of things is a particular kind of capacity that I happen to have, uh, you know, that, that, that my, my line is pretty high on and that other people might not have, but it's distributed through the population somehow. And it might or might not be trainable, don't know. Anyway, uh, long digression on this. Uh, Ken, Rick, Kevin. Um, <clears throat> I, I came across this distinction sometime in the last couple of years, can't remember where, between multitasking and multifocusing. And they gave the example of, you can listen to NPR while you're doing the dishes. You know, you can drive while having a conversation because that's multitasking where the demands are not overwhelming to your brain, but multifocusing, like driving while texting, totally different thing, divides your focus in such a way that you place yourself at risk, right? So I, I just found that to be useful because I'm, I'm with you. We multitask all the time. There's so many things that we do without even thinking about it that are unconscious behaviors that allow us to do multiple things. But we have to have a specific focus of, of I got to be really aware here in two different situations. That's a much higher cognitive load, much more difficult. And at one point in my life, I went to a graphic recording workshop because I wanted to learn how to do graphic recording. And I very quickly learned my brain is not wired like that. I cannot, if I'm drawing, I can't listen and track the conversation. Other people have this ability and it's amazing how the, the quality of their listening is so deep. And at the same time, they're being artistic and drawing and linking things and synthesizing. And I just realized, you know, I have two neurons in my corpus callosum. One goes left to right, one goes right to left, and that's about it for me. But some people have very, very thick you know, bundles there and can do amazing things. So I'll just throw that in. Um, I have more to say about listening, but it, I'll wait for my check-in because it's, you know, anyway, thank, thank you. Thank you. Two friends of the community have interesting perspectives on this. Uh, Kalia Hamlin, when she participates in a live meeting, always brings her pastels and will sit on the ground and color because she needs to distract that part of her mind so that she can be present, which is interesting. And then uh, SD Solomon Gray started a startup called Mind or something, MMMIND about multi-minding. And she talks about how mothers like are multi-minding all of the time and what that is like. And then she has really interesting ideas about Kronos and Kairos and how all this stuff is together, which I cannot paraphrase properly. But there's a there's a rich mother load of stuff that she studied around the topic. A like, mother load, huh? Uh, a mother load. Well put. I didn't even realize I'd said that. <laughs> uh, Rick, go ahead. Yeah, th th this uh, conversation reminds me, I, I can't keep up with all the threads that, of the conversations, but I did peek on one about the notion of right back. convergent um, curiosity. Um, and I recently heard a, a conversation that Simon Simic had with uh, Adam Grant and uh, Rennie Brown, and it was about creativity. It was fascinating because they were very different. And I think this speaks to our preferred modalities of being. So Simon Simic is, has, has got ADD. He doesn't read many books. He learns from personal experience and conversations. So his mind is all over the place. And people with ADD have a remarkable ability of, of, of doing a horizontal sort of scan of things, um, but may not be able to go in depth to the same level that say an introvert might do. So, uh, whereas Rennie Brown is the opposite. She studies, she reads, she does all these different things to stimulate her mind and does a lot of academic work. I mean, she's got an academic background rather than a practitioner background. And I think what some of the thing people are saying is more it reflects their preferences about their way of being in the world and the different ways of being in the world to learn. So um, I just thought I would, um, you know, provide a perspective from 
uh, different people's orientations. Thanks, Rick. Appreciate that. Kevin? I think the sentiment that you can't think like that and do this is an example of traditional orthodoxy, neurodominance, uh, trying to outlaw neurodivergence and say, this is the way to think, you can't think like that. And that's okay, that's what they always do. And you just have to realize we to stand up for the neurodivergent. Uh, if you haven't watched uh, The Extraordinary Attorney Lou, you should. I, and I, I wanna tell the story of Cornelius Clements. Uh, he was uh, an illiterate black man who lived in a shotgun shack in uh, Itawamba County. And he was a water dowser of extraordinary skill. <clears throat> and the folks doing the Texas Eastern natural gas pipeline just asked him to come out and do stuff. And it turned he could find the water that was above natural gas. And it, it, he became an expert at it. And he put his willow wands in a pool cue kind of thing. And he was flown all over Canada. Uh, and he, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm muffled. Let me, I'm, I'm on. Uh, okay is this is this easier on the speaker yeah oh, okay. much but, better uh, much better anyway, he uh he put his kids through college with that skill and but he remained uh illiterate and he said if i my mind had... now you went silent and, uh, now we can now you're back <clears throat> then they would send in the engineers and when he knew where it was to do their engineering afterwards and it was a, you know, they realized that this was a, a, a uh, something their science couldn't uh, understand, but these were, you know, uh, scouters who understood scouting. And so there is a, a kind of scouting mindset that Cornelius could do. And uh, luckily he uh, was illiterate. So because he was illiterate, his kids in the poorest part of the county all went to college. Um, and Kevin just mentioned Extraordinary Attorney Wu, which I've been watching. It's a Korean series about a woman lawyer who is autistic, and it's beautifully done. It's a little sappy because she has, she has these, her fantasy world, her, her world is about uh, uh, cetaceans and, you know, whales and porpoises and all those, all those critters uh, and how smart they are. And she knows everything about them. But the series is very tenderly done, brings me to tears really often, and is completely worth watching. And uh, in, in also just to, to dip into Korean culture and see what that's like. It's adorable. <laughs> it's adorable. It's on Netflix. So it's adorable. <laughs> awesome. So <laughs> looks like we cleared through that topic. Uh, Stacy then, uh, who else did I have? I lost my cue. Stacy then Ken. Well, I, I just want to add to what you said about this being a really nuanced topic, because I agree that you can, you know, multitask, but I do want to say that sometimes in conversations, it is a way to avoid feeling things. And I think that's where some of that sentiment comes from. And I don't want to lose that because that's, that does happen. Um, yeah. So when I read the email and I said, oh, it's the old time to check in, I said, hmm, so what have I been doing? And for the first time it hit me that what I've actually been doing these couple of years is exactly what I had done years earlier on Facebook, which was to be part of different groups and really study the dynamics. I wasn't doing it intentionally, but I guess that's what I've been doing. And I've been just paying attention to what makes people leave, what makes people stay, what makes people contribute more. And, um, yeah, so that's, I've been continuing to do that. I'm involved in a number of different groups. Um, I find myself in groups now that have more of a feminine energy, more of an emergent, you know, that's the word that's being used a lot. Um, and separately, um, this is a separate thing, but it's really on my mind. With everything going on in Twitter, I keep feeling is right underneath our feet, something's happening on Facebook. So when I'm in these different groups, I will sometimes look at the profiles and I will see that these are not real people. You can tell by the address that they're fake. And I'm like, well, Facebook has to know that there's all of these fake beings or whatever you want to call them. And as I'm seeing these new memes being created, I'm looking to see where they came from. 
and they're by these fake beings. Now, I'm not necessarily thinking that there's a bad intent. For all I know, a group of people decided we're going to go, we're going to influence Facebook land. However, that final pass through is missing. And what I mean by that is, Jerry, earlier you were saying, you were talking about like, um, who would look at accounting and who would look at this and, you know, different expert. And I think that's great because to do the work, you really need to focus. But it seems that there's not a lot of coming back to the table and going through and checking with everybody before something is being released. And I know I rambled all over, but like that um, person Rick described with ADD, I don't have ADD, but that is how I think. So I'm just trying to pull it all together. Um, Stacey, thank you. And, and interestingly, you wrapped around at the start of our call where we were talking about chat GPT and all these crazy things that can happen because some of those bots are experiments by people who are using things like chat GPT to generate dialogue and ideas and drop them into the conversation and see what happens. And some of them are acting in lots of different with lots of different motivations, some good, some bad. And like our sphere, the the public square, as uh, uh, when Musk has his best moments trying to explain what Twitter might be uh, and, and others, the public square is being diluted or improved by these things. I'm not sure which. And and I just wanted to ask you a little bit more. You're very intentionally walking into communities not always like you. Um, to try to engage with people and figure out what's up. Um, has that gotten worse? Have you gotten better at it? How's that, how's that going? Okay, well, I'll do that on Facebook and that yeah. will just be a little. I don't do that in Zoom calls. I mean, the most that are not intentionally like me would be a group like this, which might you know, be all you know, mostly male or groups that are very heavy into tech. Right. but they're still like me in terms of their heart. <laughs> um, on Facebook, I'll do it. It's, it's not bad because I will just come in with a question and I'll just look for the other people that are, people don't want to be made a fool of. And what I do is I ask them questions and I don't react emotionally so that eventually they realize they're not gonna come out looking well. I, I can't really describe what I'm saying, but as long as I don't get emotionally thrown off, it works out well because they, the, the loud mouths retreat. And what I try to do is I try to insert facts as I go along and I learn because other people insert facts. And, you know, we'll be like, is this true? You know, and even, even with friendly information, is this true? I didn't know this, you know, I try to model that. And I see other people do the same. Um, and I also, the other thing is, I think more people are learning, like there's different scams going around. So I notice that I will try to show what's happening and I see other people are doing the same thing you know, where people will get you to share something. They might be like a dog and they say this dog's lost and hurt and people will share it, but then they go back and they change what the post was about. So it's like, we're trying to educate each other. And I, I, I like Facebook because I think there's that possibility of fostering that community feeling of like, see something, say something. And that's what I was always interested in. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that, Rick. Yeah. Rick then Stewart. Yeah, just I just want to dovetail on what Stacy just said because I, I want to share an experience where um, I went to a women's group and I was in, in a conversation about equity. And women have an intuitive, uh, different uh, understanding about equity in terms of fairness than men. I won't go down that rabbit hole, but uh, but I had this interesting conversation with this um, black executive woman who. Uh, was using the word cultural competence. And that concept was sort of in vogue in medical education back in the light, late 1980s and 90s. And it was a word that I never liked uh, because I feel like I'm never culturally competent. Uh, it's, um, and so there were some black academics who wrote a, a very interesting article called Cultural Humility. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's a very different mindset. It's shifting from the sort of one up position to the one down position. 
Uh, and it's a much more nuanced way of being in terms of trying to understand others. So anyway, as a consequence of that, I got involved, involved uh, in doing a summit presentation. There was interest in that. And I'm, I'm doing a Zoom call uh, with predominantly a group of women uh, discussing the construct of cultural humility. So uh, I, I, like you, Stacey, like to go to different groups because they, they evoke different reactions in ways that wouldn't occur had you not been exposed to significant differences. So uh, I, like you, am a, a, an interloper of groups, and we need more interlopers. Thanks, Rick. Um, and I posted in the chat your post about cultural competence versus cultural humidity. Humidity, that's hilarious. Um, I think cultural humidity should be a thing. If it's not, I'm just saying. Um, and back to the queue. So uh, Ken Gill Stewart. It's not the heat, it's the humidity. Oh, yeah. I, I, uh, yeah, I just wanted to comment. Oh, sorry, Stuart. That's okay. I'm one thing that Stacy said, and that was, um, Stacy, you said, I'm not ADD. I think we're all ADD. I think we're living in an ADD world. I mean, that's part of the the multi the multitasking. I think it's one of the things that technology interjects into the uh, into the culture, into the the world that we're all inhabiting right now. We're also, you know, all a bit PTSD in, in terms of you know looking at media and seeing what's going on in the world today. Um, thanks, Stuart. Um, I, I, I like feeling like the earth could come to a sudden end right now at any moment if Kevin pinches his fingers and destroys us all. Um, <laughs> Ken, Ken, off to you. Hey, Kevin, it's great because you're on your phone and you're busy scrolling and, and you're, you're, it's like this. It's like, here's, 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 Kevin's, here's Kevin's Zoom and it's, it's delightful. Um, Mr. Homer. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I'm going to pinch us all out of existence. Yeah, now. just... So um, Gil and I, uh, Gil invited me a few months ago to join him in hosting his Living Between the Worlds calls. And, and we've been experimenting with um, giving people some deep questions for a small group conversation. And our last two calls have been on listening. And yesterday we were uh, asked people, you know, how do you listen for the concerns of others? And then how do you listen to the concerns of people you disagree with when you don't share their concerns? And I realized for myself that um, it's very hard for me to listen to concerns. I get triggered and start to engage the content and I start to get, you know, no, this is why you're wrong. And this has really um, been humbling. Speaking of humility, Rick, you know, it's, it's, I've considered myself to be a pretty good listener. And yet, like taking, for example, some of the stuff that's gone on the list in the last couple of weeks around, you know, people feeling that they're threatened and, and the list has become nasty adversarial. Rather than probe for what's the concern underneath, I've been more like, well, that I don't see the nastiness. Where Where is this coming from? You know, why is this adversarial? I mean, because someone disagrees with you, does that make it adversarial? Um, so it's just been very, very interesting to recognize the limitations that I'm I'm operating under and how I need to go deeper to if someone um, says something that I, I find challenging, what's the concern under that instead of why do I want to engage with that and prove me to be right? And in listening to other people, um, there were, there was a woman on the call who was sharing how she's listening to people who say climate change is not a big deal. And I felt so much empathy because I could just see her like, but you don't get it. It's really a big deal, which is not actually listening. That's trying to persuade. Um, and I'm, I'm very aware of how much I want to persuade people to see things the way I see them. And so I'm just, I, I, I've been sort of, um, Hold on one second. You all set? Okay, great. Thank you. That's that's our handyman. Ha handyman can go away. Yeah, handyman can go away. So I'm just really aware of of how I've been um, remiss in listening for what's the concern underneath your point, um, and do I need to do anything other than just really listen and find out what that concern is? I don't have to agree with it. I don't have to take it on as my own. But if I listen well enough. To help you feel that I've heard your concern, and I think we'll have a different conversation. That's very, very challenging for me to do that because I get triggered easily. So um, that's that's one of the things that 
tied the living between worlds together with OGM because of what's gone on in this list in the last few weeks and people, you know, making these allegations that have um, uh, been really challenging for me. When, when someone says to me, the Lancet is a corrupt magazine, you know, you can't trust it. And when I ask them, how do you, you know, why do you say that? And they're like, well, it's all, they'll say anything, you know? And I'm like, I understand that, but, but how do you validate that? You know, the person you're telling me to look at is showing up on, on right, far right wing media and conspiracy theory sites. And you're asking me to give that the same weight as a peer reviewed medical journal. And I just can't do that. So that's where I get hung up instead of saying, what's your concern underneath, which I think is trust. You know, how do we, how do we trust a source? What makes a source trustworthy and accountable? And for some people, the, it's, if it agrees with their worldview and for other people, it's like, if it challenges my worldview, but it challenges in such a way that there's evidence and a line of logical thought that I can follow, I will say, as Stuart just said a few minutes ago, I need to shift my thinking, right? Rather than I'm only looking for things that reinforce my worldview. And that's been a really big point of tension that I'm seeing going on here. So that's what I'm up to in terms of trying to figure out how to move forward in this world. Um, Kim, thank you. That gave me like 10 great things to sit and ponder. Like, um, cause I feel, I feel the same way. <clears throat> and I think, I think this sequence of calls is evidence of the ways that I get triggered when things come up because I'll go pour stuff into the chat. I'll interrupt people. I'll, I'll, I'll say, Stuart, you just said something that kind of triggers me. And this is why, um, and feed that back in and y'all are still here. So I guess that sort of works. Um, but, but I want to inspire all of us to slow down and try to ask the underlying questions and all that, because it's really important. And one of the big things that's going on right now is the undermining of facts and trust in reality, which was happening before GPT and synthetic media all showed up and they're just going to make reality muddier. Right. Um, so we're, we, we need to sort our way through this thing together, um, uh, to figure out what the future looks like. Sorry, got a little philosophical there. Um, so let's go Gil Stewart Rick. Thank Gil, is, are you going to speak or is your Fathom note taker going to speak for us? I haven't heard it speak yet. I don't know what its accent is or its gender or its neurotype, but there it is. Okay. It, it just kind of defaults on. I have to shut it off if anybody hates it. And I'm always it's pretty deep. It's, 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 it's been fun. Um, you know, Jerry, you play an interesting role in these conversations because it's a conversation among equals, but you're first among equals. And you you do what you do. It's part of why we're here. But if we all did what you did in this call, the call wouldn't work. So there's that. Um, thank you, Ken, uh, for what you shared. And uh, I'm, I'm big gratitude for Ken for joining me and co-hosting these calls. It's been a really rich process of you know collaboration and discovery. And um, I, I have a couple of things to share, but I want to comment on that first. The um, this question of how we listen and what we listen for is, is becoming very powerful for me. And I've noticed that my, my automatic inclination is to um, listen and categorize, put what people are saying into particular boxes in my experience, or to notice if I agree or disagree, or if it's true or not true, rather than, as Ken said, just listening for them and what they care about. And why this is so important to me, at least, is that... Uh, uh, my interpretation, like in, in, in this country, is that a lot of the uh, uh, fierce political gulf that's emerged over the past couple of decades um, um, is happening uh, at the surface. And below that, there is a deeply held set of common concerns, even among people who might be at each other's throats. And so for me, the only hope in this country is to be able to listen across that gulf um, um, and, you know, you see the polling that says there's super majorities on issues like climate and others, uh, but that's not how it plays out in the public dialogue. So I'm very interested in a dialogue that lets us listen to each other deeply. I was talking with a friend about this um, recently who said, um, well, I have absolutely no interest in the conversation with Donald Trump or Lindsey Graham or Kevin McCarthy. And I said, no, well, neither do I. Uh, but I have a lot of interest in well, you do. Okay. But I, I, don't. I would love to talk to them. Yeah. I but, don't. I, I yeah. Don't. Okay. Well, look, we'll, we can come back to that. I'm not interested yeah. in that, but I'm very interested in the conversation with the people who vote for them. 
which I think is a different realm of possibility. And for me, the kind of the, the 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 metric on a lot of stuff is: does a conversation open possibility or close possibility? Um, um, a, a friend challenged me some years ago. Said you're being arrogant. And I thought I said I thought I was being bold. Uh, one of the games I play and the work that I do. And I thought into that a lot and thought that maybe the difference between those is that bold opens possibility for the other people in the conversation and arrogance shuts it down for other people. So that's been a kind of a litmus for me uh, in this. Um, um, what am I up to? I'm, you know, I'm building deal flow um, for the uh, private equity for good game that we've talked about before. Uh, Kevin, I'm fascinated by your, your practice of system maps and solution sets. We'd love to talk with you more about that. I had dipped my toe into Ziggy years ago, but never got far with it. But my inclination is the, very much the same as that. I'd love to just sort of, you know, play together, see what you've done and see if it's applicable to the stuff I'm doing and just see what else we might cook up together. So thank you for that. Um, what I'm also doing is, is looking a lot at my personal practices. I've had a number of breakdowns in my games in the last couple of months, and uh, some of them all too familiar, like, you know, I've done this breakdown before. Uh, so I'm very much in the question of how do I shift my practices, my habits, my ways of doing things to be more supportive of who I am now. Um, and um, that's that's it. Well, one other, one other thing, kind of a, a functional request to people. I've got a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm realizing that I've got an enormous amount of content that I've built over the decades, some of which is extremely useful, I think, in the sustainability conversation. I got, I got no way to thank you. <laughs> Kevin, you're being generous. It might be more than 19. Um, 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 I, don't, I don't have a pipeline to turn that stuff out into the world, to repurpose it, carve it up, edit it, uh, coll collate things into books, whatever that could be useful to people who are newer into the game than I am. Uh, and so I'm looking, and, and this is not something that chat GPT and stuff like that can do yet. So I'm looking for some humans. Well, yeah, if you if you know, help me out. Point me somewhere. So a question for you, Gil, on that. Um, and I think but me, just a minute. So my my okay. request is for some humans who can help me do that. But if you got bots that can help me do that, go ahead. The floor is yours. Uh, so my question to you is an important one from my perspective in what you just said, which is: um, Is it important to you that you lock down those words and own IP over them and control them and not let them spread? Or is it more important for you that they feed the commons and like live out in the world in some manifestation, as long as they sort of find their way back to you through attribution? Um, more the latter. Yeah, I, I want them. Yeah, it, the latter for sure. I want them out in the world. If it could, if there could be some kind of monetization pathway to me of not just acknowledgement but micropayments, that would be cool. Also, the priority is get them out in the world. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing. I'm seeing myself at this point, you know, in the sustainability game was this combination of an elder uh, and a curious eight-year-old. And I think that's my superpowers to be both of those. Uh, but I'm also, I, I got a call this week from a um, 27, 28-year-old woman who used to be our neighbor, went off to be a rabbi, decided she didn't like the pastoral life and is now in business school at Johns Hopkins. And called me up, said, can I pick your brain? I said, no, you can't. I do not like sharp metal objects inserted into my skull, but I'm happy to have a conversation. And, you know, she's just hungry for the kind of experience I've had. And I say that not to toot my own horn, but to toot the horn of, you know, those of us who've been in the game for 30, 40, 50 years and folks who are coming in new and rediscovering great and reinventing and seeing things that we never could have seen great, but also could benefit from the paths that we've traveled. So I'm in the question of how do we share that and, um, and you know, and for me, stay hungry, stay curious too, not to just go sit and rest on some laurels. So there's, there's a lot there. of, there's so, a lot know, of squash you know, laurels out there somewhere. A lot of squash laurels. So if you, you know, I'd love, let's have a conversation about ways to, to um, move that kind of legacy resource, not just for me, but other people here out into the world in a way that's useful. Love to do that. And laurel leaves are sharp. You don't want to sit on them. Mm. Holly, Holly, bad. Holly, bad. Laurel, not so bad. Holly, terrible. <laughs> Holly, Holly, pokey. Holly, pokey. Brett, I don't even want to go there. Um, thank you very much, Gil. Uh, we have Stuart Klaus John. Yeah. So I don't. I, I don't have too much. Um, 
I am putting together a poetry manuscript, um, gathering testimonials. Um, kind of excited about that. Um, and and so there will be a book in um, in 2023, 365 poems, one poem for every day of the year, called um, Pilgrim's Path, Morning Practice for Seekers. So that's kind of um, I'm I'm kind of excited about that, and in, in terms of um, you know what that'll mean in terms of identity, who knows? It's just kind of an interesting. Um, interesting journey. Um, that's one. The other thing that's been kind of noodling in, in my brain, and I think it came up in the, in the, in the, for the first time with some degree of clarity in the society um, 2045 conversation, uh, being in the matrix, but really understanding that at a new visceral level, how we're all inside the matrix versus being outside of the matrix. And what is that what does that um, what does that all mean? Um, it's like yesterday I felt like I totally stepped out of the matrix. I decided to take the um, uh, the stol the solstice seriously, and and went off to um, uh, the beaches around Point Reyes, California, and um, just kind of stepped out of the world, and it was a really healing day. Um, just, you know, not doing anything and completely divorced and having, you know, some conversations that matter with, with some friends, even driving there, driving through uh, Western Marin, it's just absolutely gorgeous. And just the notion of how healing that is versus, you know, the, the built world, the, the stuff that we humans have created. Um, so, um, I guess that's my that would be my check-in going into the um going into the new year mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. thanks Stuart thank you <clears throat> um and Doug you had your hand up a moment ago and I failed to notice it before uh passing the mic to Stuart, well the, mo the moment has passed but I'll say it anyway please which is uh I don't think we are doing a check-in procedure here we're doing something else um so doug would you like to tell us about your the conversations you used to moderate and how they worked the conscious conversations uh, i'm forgetting what they're called okay the serious conversations yes okay uh we start out with a group of people like this it's a, and treat it like it's a circle and each person is invited to say what's been on their mind that's most worthy of a serious conversation. The recent innovation is whoever volunteers to go first picks the next person from the group to speak. Uh, no comments are allowed. It's you've got to listen. Uh, and because you're really being heard, you have an obligation to keep it fairly short. Uh, that seems to work pretty well. The advantage of going around the room and having everybody speak is that people need to hear their own voice in the group if they're going to be really a participant. So that gets out of the way. People have heard themselves in the group and know that the group has heard them. Uh, so it goes really quite well. Uh, if we get stuck, I often find myself saying, Look, you know, as you're talking, the purpose is not to uh, uh, convince other people, but to stimulate them. And if you see that you've done that, guess what? It's time to stop, because if you keep talking, you're going to ruin the very thing you've already created. So um, another question for you, Doug. Um, how much of your wishes for OGM check-in calls on Thursdays is based on your experience hosting serious conversations and that particular methodology you just described to us? Because it, it's a what you just described is a group process format or technique and a and a lovely one. It's not the one we're using clearly here, but it's a it's a it's a format. So how much I'm trying to figure out? Do you wish we were doing serious conversations here? Uh, I mean, that would be fun, but no, that's not my, my, 
when I think of the check-in here, it's like somebody checks in, they say what's, wh where they are, and then we go to another person. Rather than uh, starting with one person and chaining off by free association into lots of other thoughts that prevent us from going around the circle. So um, we end up with a lot of people who didn't get to do a check-in. So we're going to make it around the circle today, which doesn't always happen. And I totally agree. Um, it's really, it would be very simple for me two weeks from now uh, to run the call the way you just described, Doug, as an experiment. That's a low cost, easy thing to try. And I'm happy to do so. Um, I mean, I'm curious if anybody wants to jump in, which would you, do you have any preference a priori, just not having tried it? Do you... Do you like the mix and stir approach? Would you prefer um, check uninterrupted check-ins in the style that Doug described? How do you feel? Uh, I'll jump in because I'll I've also have to check out here in about three minutes. Uh, Please don't. So yeah, I I'm a long uh, participant in in serious conversations. It is different. It is interesting. I would say it's worth it's worth doing it occasionally uh, in OGM. You know, we could just say, in fact, I would also say, let's do a, let's do that one. Yeah, but, but I mean, we should also get, we should get a little micro consensus at least ahead of time. Like just, all right, we're going to, this is what's proposed. We're going to try this on this Thursday. And then we're going to try this other thing, you know, uh, that somebody has proposed as a, uh, as a conversation technique. It does get you to a different place. No question about that. And um, just to finish my check-in, <laughs> I asked, I just asked, chat gpt to show me a conversation between uh esther perel and either bill clinton or john f kennedy about personal relationships and it was fun to come up with that prompt the responses if, we, if you think the responses are coming from a robot they're startling it's nothing i couldn't have written it's not what i would consider my my you know finished draft that i would it's not publishable you know, but it, it's like an amazing first draft in like 90 seconds. It came back with an amazing first draft of the exchange between a president and their therapist. So on that note, I will please say goodbye, uh, continue the great, great discussion. And uh, I hope to join you in the future for different formats. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, there's a famous okay. uh, strange movie called The President's Analyst from 1967, which is kind of a cult classic uh, that some of us may know about. And thanks also for reporting in about serious conversations. And you give me the idea that one way to rethink OGM Thursday calls for the new year is to say, hey, we have a series of formats we like, and we're going to rotate between the formats. And what we've been doing this year um, is rotating, alternating between two formats. One is the mix and stir format that we're in right now. Um, and the other is pick a topic. And we're, we haven't been very good at picking topics before the actual Thursday call. So sometimes we pick a topic at the start of those calls, but then we just go deep into one thing and have a salon style conversation. So we have two formats. Um, I've tried a bit to get other people sort of hosting in different ways, in particular, not white men. That hasn't been all that successful. And I'd love to do more of that. Uh, so another format could be someone else's hosting and they get, you know, uh, facilitators choice for what they'd like to do, um, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, I would, I would enjoy figuring out what those formats are, but I don't know that we want this to be an endless format exploration <laughs> call because that, that starts to get draggy on format starts to weigh heavily on content or, or relationships. And I, I really like that we know each other pretty well because of the time we spent here, uh, Michael, then Stacy. Hi, um, I was going to, this is not a, not a check-in, but just a, a thought on the, the conversation about um, meeting format. And I think there's something uh, beautifully hybrid about the idea of un, uninterrupted uh, check-ins that are not just, you know, how we're doing and what what's alive for us but um subjects that we're thinking about that we think might be worth talking about and then yielding you know from from a relatively swift unadorned check-in process yielding a discussion it almost combines 
our current two formats into one format, and that might be um, a thing to try. That's all. Thanks, Michael. Stacey? Yeah, I mean, I guess it would depend what the intent is, but usually if I'm in a group or facilitating a group conversation, I want to know if somebody has something burning, because often I find that there's an energy that other people are feeling as well. And if you ask the person to come forward with somebody that really has something, other people feed into that as well. So I like to start from there to see where there's the strongest pull. But again, it depends on what the intention of the call is. Thank you. Other thoughts on this? Cool. There's a tendency in a group uh, to try and lower the group anxiety. And one way that a group does that is focus on the first person who speaks and try and make that the topic. Uh, in serious conversations, we start with the idea that each person should say what's been on their mind that's most worthy of a serious conversation. So by the time you've gone around the circle, you have a lot of interesting ideas that are not necessarily commensurate with each other, but very stimulating. So it's that idea of getting a lot of voices into the conversation before you start the, the interactive conversation. Um, over time, and how often were you holding the serious conversations? Were they monthly? Uh, no, they were weekly. Weekly, okay. So, and I assume that you had a steady body of participants. Did they say different things each week or were they like, like there's a, a bunch of us who have a thing in our heads, which is worthy of serious conversation. And if I were asked that question every week, I would sort of be saying the same thing roughly every week and varying it a little bit. Did that happen or was it different from that? I think that happened very little, but the group would be tolerant of it. Uh, this gets into some of the empirics of what we learned. Sometimes the people who tend to perseverate around a, a single type topic, if they're allowed to talk for a while, uh, they will dig themselves out of that into new territory. But it's it's not easy. Yeah, and then so you would go around the circle, and then uh, I don't know how long the sessions were, but would you have half the session then to, to pick one? Would the group come to consensus on one of the topics presented, or how did that work? No, just you would go around the circle. Uh, when the last person had talked, the conversation was open to where, wherever it was going to go. No guidance. Okay. Where you were the in you were the convener, but not in that case, facilitating where the topic went. You were just letting it go wherever it went. Yeah, my my task was to uh, try and keep it short, it's because people tend to perseverate. There are always people in a group who, as they hear themselves talk, it's a sign that they should keep talking. That does. So are these are these still happening? Uh, we have uh, COVID really broke it apart. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had an online Zoom version, um, and um, that's not taking quite so well because we're finding that right now people are really pressed in so many different directions mm -hmm. that the conflict of what group to be and where is, has really increased. Mm -hmm. So the answer is sort of. We're continuing once a month right now. And what year was the first one? When did you start it? Oh, 10 years ago. Oh, okay. I thought it was like 20 years ago. Uh, well, some, it might have been. <laughs> um, Gil, go ahead. Yeah, quick poll on, on, the, on the question of amount of time. I'm in about, I think, five or six conversations a week of this sort. How, show, show of fingers, how about the rest of you? How many, how many of these kind of things are you involved in? Actually, three. <laughs> Kevin, you got fingers, Kevin? <laughs> <laughs> At least it wasn't the middle finger. That's good. Just this one. Yeah. <clears throat> Most of my other stuff calls are about doing stuff. <laughs> cool. <clears throat> um, thanks. Or uh, with friends that aren't. <laughs> yeah. To finish our round, it's Klaus, Michael, me. Yeah, maybe if I can take us back to the idea of listening and hearing. Um, 
I was really intrigued with Kevin's uh, uh, experiment here with GPT because it, it's uh, it's just better than you would think it, it could be. Um, and it also brings me to, to the donut uh, model that he's using. I'm working on a webinar series for next year that's titled sort of from farm to fork. And you can apply that to any system, uh, but each, each, each process you know, has individual actors that look at the same delivery of um, a service or a product from a different angle, different perspective, right? So um, my, my first webinar, actually, I have uh, a completely diverse group of, 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 of actors where there is a farmer who, who looks at his land and what he needs to grow and, and, and what he needs to do to, re to restore his soil back to health. But then from then you need an aggregator. You know, you need a logistics provider. You need a, a processor. You need a wholesaler and a retailer. And you finally need the fork consumer. And for every single participant, this looks completely different, right? A consumer has completely different needs and perspectives than the farmer would or the aggregator <laughs> would. So to create a story that that uh, connects you know, these, these, these different actors to work jointly on a common on a common outcome, which in this case would be to restore soil and watersheds back to health, um, sequester carbon and I mean all these technical things. So how do you convey to the consumer? who has like zero understanding and zero uh, uh, um, understanding of all the technical components here. So to, to hear people, you know, uh, uh, in, in ways that, uh, that sense-making uh, for them becomes, becomes uh, a thing, you know, where, where, where uh, they, they understand um, from from why this is good for me, for me personally, and what then what do I get uh, to to uh, benefit out of here? I mean that's that's really um, that's really a a challenging thing to do. We, and I've spent all my life, you know, in, in marketing and and and, uh, and basically in process management. But this is different because you have like an overarching goal, right? So you have within the perspective of climate change and um, and environmental uh, 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 restoration needs uh, that need to that need to govern the entire system. And this is why I keep on talking about the hierarchy of the system or the hierarchy of information, right? So there is this overarching goal. But it means something different for everyone in that in that chain. So, so that's why the the donut uh, uh, economy that that uh, Ken has been stitching together there is is that donut model is basically saying the same thing if I understand it correctly. Uh, so anyway, so that's that's my my uh, focus and and uh, challenge for. 2023. You know, we have our first webinar scheduled for February. You now we have the uh, owner of Lando Lakes there that uh, is a dairy company, and they have developed a uh, organization called Tutera, which is a farmers co-op, and they're working with farmers to improve the quality of their soil, which improves the quality of the crop coming out of the soil, which improves the quality of feed going into their cows, which improves the quality of the milk that goes into their butter and into their, into their dairy products. And we have a, a hedge fund manager there who's focused on uh, investing you know, into, into this supply chain and a farmer. And then we have the Bionutrient Food Association in there to explain how the quality of the soil microbiome is reflected in your gut and how the nutrient density and the quality of nutrients in that soil is being uh, is is being reflected uh, in your own microbiome in your gut. So yeah, so I'm 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 really uh, uh, intrigued with uh, uh, the need to listen empathically and and uh, uh, within the context of of uh, the person you're listening to or the the, the group you're listening to.
Um, thanks for that last sentence, Klaus, because I was about to ask you to connect this back to listening, which is what you started with. And, and there you go. Um, Klaus, can I ask how the class was on the call yesterday? I'd just like to know how it was for you. Well, it, it was great. You know, the second call, which was um, uh, uh, the topic was how do you listen to people you disagree with, right? Well, we were right into into explaining why my opinion is uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's important. You know? It's hard. Yeah. Here's why I'm right and you're wrong. Any yeah. questions? <laughs> we got we got into COVID, right? And we're saying so. Let's take COVID, and, and I suggest maybe COVID, maybe climate change, maybe some other topics. But we got stuck on COVID, and boy, it just instantly started to to get uh, interesting. Um, <clears throat> thanks, thanks so much, uh, Michael. It's uh, your con, and I'm just noticing that Carl was on the call because the chat was hiding his name on it. So, Carl, I'll put you in the queue as well. But uh, Michael, uh, floor is yours. Hello, um, I am I am packing for a little holiday travel, so I've been off camera, but I'm here. Um, I was struck by something that. Um, someone was was saying earlier, um, and I'm I'm trying to remember. I mean, it was it was just generally. I think it was Gil and someone else talking about the way that we um, identify uh, people as members of of factions. Um, I don't recall if the if the terms red and blue were. Um, were identified, but um, thinking a lot about um, how just how damaging it is that we're that we're lumping entire sets of views together, and and I you know I hear that in some of the conversation that has come up. Um, partly in the in the email um, chain and and partly here uh, around othering Republicans and um, you know in everyday life I have this experience a lot. Um, it's funny I'm, I'm I'm traveling because uh, I'm um, Airbnb being my apartment. Um, uh this week and the people who are staying there are when they came in you know i was i was painting them with the brush of hmm these people probably aren't going to love the big black lives matter like you know thing in my window and you know some of the other stuff on my bookshelves and you know what's that going to do are they going to treat my place nicely and you know and I I did my best to bond with them um my my, uh, my lingua franca for commonality across political divides is always sports um so uh it turned out you know that that we could talk about their beloved Jacksonville Jaguars who they were coming to see play the Jets and you know it, it was good and and I I hope that established enough human connection that you know all will be well but you know at the same time i wished that i hadn't been reading those signals and hadn't had any reason to lump them um and nor they to lump me um and that our viewpoints on things were more complicated um as they generally would be, I think, if we weren't encamped. Um, and, and I feel like, I don't know this to be true. I, I, you know, have not done my own research as some like to say, um, but I, I do think it was much more possible to be, you know, anti-abortion Democrat, a, you know, um, uh, liberal Republican. I mean, all, all the things that are sort of verboten now 
you know, I, I can remember, I mean, just in, in just thinking of, of senators when I was a kid, you know, um, and, and, you know, people who were around that, that were, um, you know, I don't know what the word is, but they didn't, they didn't fit neatly into, into categories. And yeah, a fond wish to me is that, um, that political parties just didn't exist, you know, that, that everyone was an independent and, and we had to do our, our voting for people based on, you know, discerning what their views were and saying, well, I agree with this person on these issues that are a priority to me, even though I disagree with them on that issue that, you know, I don't value as highly, et cetera, you know, and that happened across the map. Um, so yeah, I, I just uh, I wanted to to underline and and resonate with the the notion that that boxing people is really creating big problems for us, and we don't have to do that. That's me. I'll go back to packing. Mm -hmm. Michael, thank you so much um, for sharing that. That's you're making me realize that. These days, I think often when we pick up one cue um, about a person's potential point of view, it's kind of connected to a whole constellation of things that they probably also believe. And 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 I think that this, we sort of jumped there pretty quickly, and we're we're seen to be in an era where that's happening a lot, partly through external stimuli and div divisiveness and a bunch of other things going on. So, uh, Kevin and Carl. Really briefly, I, you know, I've done a bunch of investigative reporting in the Christian right and how it, it was the real creator of a lot of the tools that the political right is now using. And one of the things of their epistemology of fundamentalism is divisive and uh, militant and using a particular text as a weapon. And so I've found some ways to ask them essentially the question is, do you need to demonize or can you find commonality with the other and look for things that look like uh, there is a slippery slope toward infection if you allow the other in. And there's ways you can get at that kind of way of thinking in places that are not their central point of concern, but you find backwaters where that way of thinking is there. Because if you go to the central place that they are worried about, you know, vaccines or whatever, uh, they will have answers ready. But if, if you go to the backwaters where they use that way of thinking and show that, you know, there is a need to demonize as opposed to find common ground with the other, then you know that that module is in place. And so finding common ground will not be their goal because they find common ground is the source of infection. And, uh, so anyway, uh, I've learned to deal with them because I've had to deal with them a lot of ways and find out about them in ways that they didn't smell me coming. Uh, and uh, so anyway, I found that that works. Thank you. That's, uh, I'm, I'm observing what you're saying. It's great. Um, Carl and Mike. Okay, so well, um, I was um, thoroughly I'm surprised, pleasantly surprised by seeing Jacksonville upset the Cowboys there. So, <clears throat> um, being a Commanders fan. Um, yeah, and then, um, well, one of the things I did wanted to ask uh, with the social network, if you know people, anybody who's a um, certified facilitator in the six thinking hats method. Hmm. Uh, I'm sure if you might know somebody, Jerry, or... Uh, I don't, but if anybody does, please type their name into the chat or raise your hand or whatever. Yeah, because I'm going to track that down because as I was looking more at the Believing Game, which I brought up several times, I kind of see that as kind of wearing the yellow hat um, type of thing where the science is the black hat. So somebody who's facilitating that, but I want to talk with them about saying if they, about facilitating a a, um, a session about the um, believing game because um, 
This is Peter Elbow's thing? Yeah, that's the Peter Elbow's. I think you mentioned it before, so I put it in my brain, so I just pasted it into the chat. Right. But, but I don't know that much about it. Um, I have it yeah. under the thought, believing is seeing, <clears throat> which is the opposite of seeing is believing. Right, well, it's it's more of contrasting with the, basically a kind of the scientific method is uh, incomplete. It's like only half the picture, really. So it's, as I said, it's been an ongoing thing. Um, yeah, and then I guess what was, is there a specific topic today? I was kind of pulled off. I, I wasn't even sure if we were meeting today. Yeah, today is our check-in format. So um, I was just about to yeah. go to you to check in. Okay. Um, yeah, well, I've been um, getting quite involved with the um, International Society for the um, System Sciences, the IEEES. So um, then, um, yeah, there's a, a lot of good things going on there. One of the things I've been looking at, I think I've posted it before too, but there's that Jeremy Connell wait whenever he's been um, getting a lot of attention from the LinkedIn editors. He's like, been, but he did this, he's got this whole process where he's analyzing speeches and stuff. He's got like a whole process for doing, for doing that. So, I mean, with the IEEE too, it's like, or, like the storytelling um, is so huge. In fact, I've, can't find who it's attributed to, but the shortest distance between two people is a story. And I think there's lots of, so I think one of those things where a group, they've got like, I think it's like 24 system integration groups, SIGs <laughs> or whatever. So it's like um, way too, the uh, energy's kind of diluted. So where do we really need to focus attention? So I'm going to be I'm going to be talking about really kind of looking at, at at story and some of the systems approaches to to um, story. To Appar so. Apparently, that's Patty Dye is what Google the Google tells me, and I don't know. Yeah, that's is. that's what I I saw too. Yeah, in fact, somebody had it had that as a uh, as a slide in the presentation I'm reviewing on on um, DEIA, which is mm -hmm. uh, my primary um, one of, um, focus at work. And stuff, which is with the federal government, it's great. I mean, we have to have the accessibility is in there. It's not just DEI; it's actually DEIA. So mm -hmm. accessibility doesn't have to be the, an afterthought. <laughs> it's kind of the saying there, but um, so that that's work. I also am involved in reviewing software requests for whether people have been doing the um, 508. So I'm kind of doing 508 reviews. Don't know what a 508 review is. Um, 508 section 508 is of the Rehab Act, oh, okay, 1973. But it requires that um, ICT is accessible for people with disabilities. Cool. So that's um, and then just uh, I did a presentation um, last on the ninth to honor. Um, Doug Engelbart's the demo there. I did a I did a um, presentation about his influence on my work, and then I've I'm posting a link to it. But I, um, there's this three practice circle thing, and um, it could be um, I post a link to the list. There's actually the one up um, coming up next next week that's talking some about COVID. But it would be interesting to you don't have to talk at all. You can just join and and listen and stuff, but it would be interesting to have some people you know, uh, pick one of one of them and then we then we could kind of talk about it afterwards and see what people think of that process because it's they take on a lot of challenging controversial topics and it's like one hour kind of is set so it's it's kind of a um, it's a really nice model we've actually been adopting it at uh, Field and Graduate University. And um, so we actually, they actually are um, paying to have some people become certified referees. So we're actually looking to use it for internal conversations around DEI and decolonizing the curriculum and some other challenging social justice issues. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll complete the check-in then. <laughs> Thanks, Carl. Thanks very much.
Uh, Mike, if you want to comment and check in, that'd be awesome. Sure. Uh, I, I can't comment so much since I just joined about 10 minutes ago, uh, although I wish I'd been part of the conversation. Uh, I think I've mentioned a book before on, on called Dreaming in Chinese, which is a book by Deb Fallows about how the Chinese see the world and how that worldview is shaped by their language. And so some of the comments that people were making about how different subsets of Americans see different things. Um, just a few random observations. Um, every two or three months, I watch an hour of Fox News. And I did it this morning to see how they reported on uh, Zelensky's speech last night. Sure. Absolutely surreal. How'd that go? It was it was it was America's newsroom. So it's you know a magazine format, five or six minutes on each topic, five minutes on the weather in the Midwest, seven minutes on the terrible things happening on the border and how it's all Biden's fault. Um, <clears throat> four minutes of very positive news coverage about Senator about Governor Ron DeSantis trying to force st to stop teachers unions from getting their dues um I, I, it wasn't until minute 24 that they devoted 20 seconds to Zelensky's speech 20 seconds and that was to tease a later segment that happened at 33 minutes five sentences of the speech and then six minutes on how Putin is threatening to send ICBMs our way and uh, why Republicans should ask hard questions about Ukrainian aid. Wow. It was mind boggling. And, the piece and that... no mention of the fact that the Congress actually got bipartisan agreement on keeping the government open. Uh, so again, I, I, I encourage all of you to do this at least once every two months. Wow. And particularly when there's big news. I mean, it's really interesting to see how different the world looks. Um, it's not all about the internet. It's not all about Facebook. A lot of mind control is happening directly through, and, and not just through Tucker Carlson. I mean, this is the standard Fox News program. Um, changing topics, more optimistic. I'm enjoying some quieter time now to reach out to old friends. Uh, as an avid Facebooker, I have a all these Facebook friends who know what I do on a weekly basis, if not a daily basis. But then I have all these old friends, about a third of whom aren't on Facebook. And I, I think it's time for Christmas cards to make a comeback. So I'm going to take my take my 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 10 most popular Facebook posts and put them on a piece of paper and send it to all my all my non-Facebook friends who probably have forgotten who I am. But I'm also catching up by phone on some of these people with some of these people and these are you know friends who go all the way back to college or even high school <clears throat> and uh and i'm doing some thinking about what i want to change in the coming year uh, for, you know and how to how to use what i do at carnegie to change the debate make the world a little better but i'm so glad i was able to pop into this group i i have a conflict every other thursday so i um look for are, are we meeting in between Christmas and New Year's, or are we um, taking? Uh, we are, and and in particular because uh, in in years past Thursday has been like Christmas Eve and stuff like that, and we still met. Uh, and this year it was shifted over a little bit, so it's even it's kind of safer. So yes, we'll we'll be we'll be meeting. Well, I hope hope I can join you then, and um, can talk about some of the, my grand travel plans for the coming year. I've uh, gone around the world in September, and I went to India in October, and I went back to India in November. Wow! So I had lots of uh, adventures there. That's but, cool. Uh, looking at Australia for the coming year. And anybody who likes beer on the call, install the Untapped app and follow Mike. Uh, how many posts do you have about beers now on Untapped? Well, I'm, I'm in search of the ultimate beer, so I sample. A lot of beer, three ounces at a time, and I'm up to almost seventeen hundred beers. So, yeah, it's a it's a it's a wonderful example of the hive mind. A million people ranking beers every week. What are some of your favorites, Mike? Uh, sign up. 
<laughs> I, I'm not going to do that. I'm I'll not going to put another app on my phone. But. I, have, I have a list of about 30, 35 star beers that I now his, have his, back. His, his favorites list is, is cool and many of which I've never heard of. So yeah. Well, what I want. Thing, so my, for those of you in the DC area, there was an, <laughs> there's an incredible version of the Tempest on uh it, it's just been extended a few more weeks but it's uh, at the roundhouse theater I, I think we have one or two people in the dc area this is mind-bogglingly good we saw it last night oh, that so Mike, awesome. be clear, be, be, beer is why you travel and carnegie is the excuse yeah we do some serious uh vacationing too but yeah beer beer is certainly one of the goals oh, so, you so ever, Mike, have you ever run into justin kavanaugh and your beer tasting because remember, he likes beer. Oh, <laughs> he likes it a lot. <laughs> Michelob, I think. Yeah. You mean Brett? Brett you Kavanaugh. Mean Brett. Kavanaugh. Yeah. Not Justin. Not, not Justin. Yeah. Um, and and strangely enough, Mike, uh, just last week or something, I was driving around Portland, and there's a place called John's Market, which has an insane collection of beers here. And I had the wish in my head that I could walk into that store and that the untapped app would show me the overlap between the inventory in the store right now and your favorites list. <laughs> I was like, damn it, if that could, like, it'd be a lot of work to sort of crawl the aisles and figure this out. But if they, if, if this could just light up and go, hey, he, we have these, I would just go pick them off the aisles. Well, they, 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 the smart bars now do this. You go in and they list the tap list and they put the untapped listing for each one. That's awesome. That's yep. fantastic. Um, Stuart. Uh, yeah, uh, just just briefly, I wanted to add something quickly into my check-in, and that is um, on Friday night, I saw a play at Berkeley Rep called Remembering Jan Karski with um, David Strathern and a one-man show that was funded by uh, a unit out of Georgetown University that wants to take important political topics and, and get them into the uh, media <laughs> through art in a, in a certain way. And, and they kind of almost commissioned the writing of this. But I'd never heard of Jan Karski until I was in Krakow this past summer. Karski is an Otto Schindler-like um, uh, 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 figure <laughs> who um, had audiences with President Roosevelt during World War II before um, the US got into the war. He met with Justice Felix Frankfurter and reported the atrocities in Poland and in Auschwitz specifically. And Frankfurter said to him, I don't believe this. N not that he didn't believe what he was saying, the truth of it, but that um, he, his mind couldn't comprehend the atrocities perpetuated on, on, a, on a human population. And I think that that's going on in Ukraine today um, in the sense of what Putin is doing. And, um, it just made me think about, you know, what I slash we um, might be doing more of, um, and it kind of ties in in many ways to to what Mike just shared about Fox News. I have the same practice, by the way. And the other thing that I wanted to say was comment on on people um, this conversation about having different opinions than others. Um, there's a classic story, I think it's out of the mediation universe, where, you know, somebody comes and, and shares their opinion, and the mediator goes, you're right. And somebody else shares an opinion. And maybe it was a rabbi story. I don't know. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. So just the notion of that, there is so many different um, rights. <laughs> it's a very much an individual thing. And of course, there are certain, you know, wrongs that we would all kind of uh, agree to, but just that bigger mind when listening to others to allow um, <clears throat> different perspectives to be part of conversation and to be part of your mindset when you're listening. That's all. Thank you all. Love that. Thank you, Stuart. Bentley, hi. Do you want to check in? Uh, I can. Um, uh, has... I'm sorry, I'm late. Uh, has the topic of the sense doing thing already come up, or uh, we we talked about it very very little. So if you wanted to go there, that'd be awesome. <clears throat> yeah. So um, I and several of the people have been hashing, uh, hacking around, kind of thinking about sense making and sense doing since the conversations over the last uh, in this meeting and in the. Um, 
email list. And so we have a document, a Google Doc that I just kind of threw up and throw some ideas on. Uh, there's lots of confusion and uh, crosstalk, uh, which is typical. Um, so we're trying to uh, sort all that out. So I've been playing with it last night and this morning. Um, uh, Rob's been doing a lot of work in there along with several other people. Uh, Rob O'Keefe, which I don't think he's on the call. Um, uh, so, so yeah, we're coming up with some ideas on just how we might want to collaborate in the sense of making space, which is something OGM has been focusing on doing for a long time. So um, welcome to join. We can post some links to those things or probably a great place to go is the Mattermost channel. And we'll try and on since doing, and that's the, the current name, we might rename it. Um, so that's where we'll be kind of um, posting updates and you can kind of see how to participate if that's something you're interested in. And I just put a link to the doc that Bentley mentioned in the chat. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and all come on over to the Mattermost channel and join the conversation if you'd like. We're trying to figure out how to do stuff rather than talk about doing stuff. Yeah. And I guess, Jerry, we probably also need, I keep meaning to post in that channel saying, hey, we're thinking about doing a call, call after the holidays. Maybe I did post something. I don't know. I've done so much this morning, I've forgotten. Um, uh, some of us in, enjoy working in a more synchronous uh, in, in the way that this idea is, these ideas are flowing. Synchronous may be more effective than this kind of asynchronous document updating um, or a combination of the two. So, Thanks, Bentley. It's an open playground. Totally appreciate that uh, description of what we're up to. Um, I want to go back to one thing Stuart said just for a moment because it's it's in my mind a bunch and I don't think I talk about it enough or I haven't sort of gotten it out, which is about Putin's war crimes and sort of the, the atrocities happening right now in Ukraine. <clears throat> and what I, so what one of the things that impressed me in a very negative way was that in a couple of months of activity, uh, Russia could turn parts of Ukraine into Grozny. Uh, and if anybody remembers sort of the, the, the wars in Chechnya and, and, and Afghanistan and how awful those cities looked, um, hey, guess what? Uh, there are vast swaths of Ukraine that look like that now, where every building has been damaged and needs to be rebuilt, where the damage is, is extreme and complete. And then on top of that, when occupiers came in, they were busy torturing and doing a whole bunch of things. And all of that says to me, hey, look, if it's really obvious and evident that a country is perpetrating war crimes live now, does that not raise the whole situation to some other level for the United Nations or NATO or somebody else where some other intervention is mandated? Uh, because the, these crimes are already being proved. I and mean, one of the things that's happening as, you, as Ukraine takes back territory is that some of the first people who go into the newly won back territory are the evidence collectors. <laughs> They're, they're busy dig, finding mass graves and identifying bodies. They're busy doing all these kinds of things. It's like there's, there's a whole series. And, and maybe I'm at the end of an extremely efficient marketing chain that has convinced me that there's war crimes going on, but I don't think so. I think from Bucha onward, uh, we've, some, we've seen something that's unusually brutal. Um, and so I, I'm no international diplomat, but I, I want to know why the world allows this to keep happening as it's happening because it's live right now this stuff is still going on there's no no question in my mind which is not the highest note to end the call on just before christmas so if somebody I wanted have a poem. To, you know i was gonna say ken if you have a poem uh that would be a lovely thing to add to this to, as, a, as a bow go ahead mike or, or if people have uh a single gift that they've gotten at Christmas or given at Christmas that they want to tell us about, maybe just type that in the chat, you know, something that um, they'll always remember and which some of us could steal and give, you know, replicate. <laughs> I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm terrible at gift giving, but every so often I hear of just a golden idea and I, 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 I use it. That's a lovely idea. Thanks, Mike. So anybody who wants to share gift ideas during the poem, 
please do. So another one of my favorite poets is Wystawa Zimborska, who is a famous Polish poet who won the Nobel Prize for Literature. And this is called Classifieds. Who's ever found out what location compassion, hearts imagination, can be contacted at these days is here with urge to name the place and sing about it in full voice and dance like crazy and rejoice beneath the frail branch that appears to be upon the verge of tears. I teach silence in all languages through intensive examination of the starry sky, the synanthrop's jaws, a grasshopper's hop, an infant's fingernails, plankton, a snowflake. I restore lost love. Act now, special offer. You lie on last year's grass, bathed in sunlight to the chin, while the winds of summer's past caress your hair and seem to lead you in a dance. For further de details, write dream. Wanted, someone to mourn the elderly who die alone in old folks' home. Applicants don't send forms or birth certificates. All papers will be torn. No receipts will be issued at this or later dates. For promises made by my spouse, who's tricked so many with his sweet colors and fragrances and sounds, dogs barking, guitars on the street, into believing that they still might conquer loneliness and fright, I cannot be responsible. Mr. Day's widow, Mrs. Knight. Thank you, Ken. That was beautiful. Happy Solstice, Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, Festivus, New Year's, all that stuff. Thank you all. Um, until next week. Bye. Bye.